There are two readings today. The first is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The second reading is from Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel today is from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had, been belie who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in this place, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that we can gather as a community of believers to hear your word, to be filled up through music as we gather. Lord, help us to set aside the things on our to-do list, the things that have been today that keep us from you, the things on our to-do list that keep us from focusing and hearing your word. Help us to clear our minds to be filled up and to be sent out. We ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we get to come together, we get to talk about renewing our faith. Um, these 10 confirmants that are here today are going to stand up in front of you all and say that they take on this faith for themselves. Last night we got to have a baptism, a baptism when we, a sacrament in which we claim and name these kids, um, and sometimes adults, and we say that they are gods now and forever. And in this confirmation piece, we have walked with them. We have said that we are going to bring them um, to this place. We're going to teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, that we're going to walk beside them, um, that they are going to know whose they are in the faith. 
And now we give that to them, and they're going to stand up in front of um, all of us and say that they hope to take this on for themselves and to continue to grow in their faith. And it's a time of renewal, renewing the promises of their baptism. And I want to invite all of us into that renewal also. Something that us pastors get to do every year is we get to meet with these confirmants um, for about a half an hour, they get to fill out this packet, um, which I'm sure they love. Look at those faces. They're so excited. Don't, don't pay on the camera to them. No, just kidding. They get to come and they get to meet with us, and they get to talk about what they believe, and um, they get to express their faith in a very sincere way. And it's something that we all love. It's renewing to us as pastors and in our faith walk. And it's also a reminder to me that we shouldn't just be asking ninth graders in the fall to think about their faith and to really put into action and to word what it is that we do believe. It's a great time for me to remember to be intentional about what it is that I believe and to continue to check in and renew my own faith. So the beginning of this packet, um, we talk about this word. So we, they, have to, they have to define um, who is God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, baptism. They have all these words. And towards the bottom, one of the words that they have to define is grace. And I would say about, I don't know, 90% of the time they come in and they're like, I have no idea how to define this word. And I say, you and everyone else, right? And so I want to think with you about this word grace. We used it during the children's message, right? We are saved by grace through faith. It's one of those church words that we throw around and we use all the time, but it's hard to define. So I want you to think for a second, if you came across a friend who said, I'm not Christian and I don't understand stuff, would you explain to me the word grace? What would you say to them? How would you define grace to someone that is new to the faith or that doesn't know Christianity? What in the world is grace? We all have a little bit of an understanding. So Pastor Dwight um, has this five letter, so I want you to hold up your hand like this, okay? And then repeat after me, G, G, R, a C E G R A C E God's riches so say that with me God's riches at Christ's expense God's riches at Christ's expense now you got to hold your hand up like this forever I'm just kidding Okay, so God's riches at Christ's expense. So let's break that down a little bit. What does that even mean? What are God's riches? God's riches are forgiveness of sins. God's riches are abundance of life here and now and abundance of life in the next life to come. God's riches is knowing that you are a child of God no matter what and that you have been saved by grace through the waters of baptism, that you are God's now and forever and you can lean into that and know that you are God's. But how do we get those? At Christ's expense. At whose expense? Christ. It's not because of what I have done or what you have done that we are saved, but it's because of the one who claimed us and named us and does that every single day. The God that reaches down when we've messed up or when we haven't done the things that we um, should have done, when we've left things undone, the God that reaches down continuously saving us and washing us anew in the waters of our baptism to say that you are enough. God's grace is something that is bigger than any of us. I also explain it this way. I was in ninth grade, and it was the, the spring, and I was driving, okay? And um, I had a car, and I got off work, and I must not have... I, worked like three blocks from my house, so let's put this into perspective for a second. 
It was probably the only left-hand turn, probably the only turn that I made, right? And I didn't look all the way, and there was a little bridge, and I took a left, and guess what was there? A car. And it was, it must have been the fall, because it was Super Bowl weekend, okay? So I remember clearly being the Super Bowl weekend. I got home, I pulled in, and I thought my dad was gonna, like, flip out, right? And no one was home. So then I had to stew in it even more. And I walked, I remember pacing the house. I'm like, when dad gets home, I'm not gonna have a car anymore. And I really don't have a lot of money because I worked at Kmart. And you know, like I was just so stressed out. Have you ever felt that way? Just knowing that you did something wrong and just sitting in it. And I remember my dad coming home and he looked at me and he said, Sarah, it's okay. And I was like, what? He said, people make mistakes, it's okay. It's gonna be fine, you'll be fine. I'm like, I don't, I don't have any consequences? Like, <laughs> I don't have to pay anything, I don't have to like do something, I don't have to be sorry for 20 million years, I don't have to, and he said, it's okay. Grace is bigger than that. It's when we know the weight of what we have done and left undone and God says, it is okay, and you are loved and forgiven. The second part of this, so we, we define all these things, and then we get to the third part of this, and this is the renewing our faith part, okay? So now I have been saved by grace, I'm really good, everything's great, and then I ask the question to the ones that meet with me, why can't I do whatever I want then, right? Because if God has saved me by grace and I know my salvation, why don't I get to just do and go whatever I want? What would the world look like if we went and did whatever we wanted and we only cared about ourselves? I wouldn't want to live in that world. I know that I haven't been saved and forgiven to live in that world. When I know whose I am and I no longer have to worry about myself, I am free to look around and care for those around me. I am free to love and care for those around me. That's one of the things that Martin Luther said, you are free of all. You have been set free, but you are still a servant to all. Being set free calls us to care for those around us. My best way of explaining this is, um, I don't know, this has been several years ago, probably 10, I took middle schoolers um, skiing and none of the middle schoolers had ever been skiing before. So I had about 12 middle schoolers that I put skis on and some poles and said good luck to, right? Just kidding. I did a little bit more than that. So they started on the bunny hill, and when you learn how to ski with these long skis on, you can only focus on yourself, okay? And so these kids were on these skis and they were focused on themselves and sometimes they would take out people beside them or sometimes they just, they were not being very good friends in the morning, right? They weren't worried about like making sure that all the people were invited or that everyone was cared for. And then they started going up the big hills and they were working on that and that was a little stressful. And so kids were being left behind and my friend left me and you know, I'm not a part of the group anymore and I was hearing those things. Well, middle schoolers pick up on things really fast, so about after lunch, they had the skiing thing down. Way better than I can ski, right? And so they're, they're owning it, and they've got, they've got themselves figured out, they know how to do the skis, and all of a sudden, because they were okay with who they were, guess what they could do? Put their head up and look around. And they could see the people that needed to be invited. And even if they weren't friends with them and they didn't come with them on the trip, they knew they were with our group, they could say, hey, Johnny, you want to ride the lift with me? Do we have everyone with us before we go up to the hill and make sure that everyone comes down? When they no longer had to worry about who they were, they could look around and care for others. It's the same way when we know whose we are in Jesus Christ, we can look around and see the needs of others. We can look around and care for others. So this third part of when we meet with these middle schoolers, we ask them three questions. And they've been helpful for me to renew my faith 
these last few years, and I want to share them with you because I think it's helpful to re-ask how are we looking around and how are we sharing our faith with others. So the first one is, I promise God that I will. And really, this is about my promise. So this part of the cross, my relationship with God, I need that so that way I can do this part, and that's the relationship with others. So I promise God that I will. And I want you to think about that in a really re real way, not in a middle school way of, um, how was school today? Good. What'd you do? Nothing, right? I want you to think about things that you can do to write on paper of ways that you're going to renew your relationship with God. Because if you're like me and I say I'm going to do better tomorrow, I don't even know what that means and I never do better because I what? Have no action items, right? Tomorrow I'm going to go to the gym at some point. Or tomorrow I'm going to eat better. What does that even mean, right? We need to put action items in there. I'm going to join a Bible study. I'm going to get some friends together and be in the Word. I'm going to whatever that looks like. And here's the deal. Your faith walk looks different in your 20s than in your 50s. It looks different than in your teens and in your 60s. It is okay, and these are important questions to ask ourselves, because as I grow, I also need change in my life and what that looks like. The second question is, I promise my church that I will. We gather in this place, and we are church together. When you show up to this place, you are important when you are here. You are important when you're not here. You are a part of this community, and when you're not here, you are missed. Sometimes I walk in those doors because I need this community for me. Sometimes I walk in these doors because others need me to be a part of community and need me to be here. We fill each other up, we hear each other's stories, we remind each other of whose we are in Christ Jesus. It is important to be church together. This place takes many people to run and to be church together. And each and every one of you are important for this place. And if you don't worship here, you are important for where you do worship. We are church together. And then the third question is, I promise the world that I will. I want you to think outside the box a little bit. What does it mean to be church in the world? So we come here as people who need to be told again that we are loved and cared for and we're saved by grace. We're church together here, and then we are sent out into the world to live our faith out in the world. And what does that mean and look like for you? Maybe it's stepping out of your box and serving at the banquet. Maybe that's a little nerve-wracking to you, or going and worshiping at the St. Saint, uh, Saint Dismas. Maybe it's a friend that has been sitting in the back of your brain and you know you should call up and have coffee with because they need a listening ear and a friend to love them and care for them and tell them about whose they are. Maybe it's inviting someone in. Maybe it's making rituals and traditions within your family of how you're going to pass on the faith. What does being church or being Christ in the world look like to you? God has loved you and saved you and forgiven you, and you are enough. And therefore, we are called into the world to be God's hands and feet and to be sent out to let all know that they have been saved by grace through faith. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, that you have saved us and that you love us and that you forgive us. Heavenly Father, help us to be renewed in our faith. We just pray over these ninth graders that you would continue to grow their faith, that their faith would look different now than it does in five years, that they would continue to dig into your word and know you more deeply. 
Lord, we just pray that we, they would um, be able to go out into the world and share your grace and forgiveness and love and to be church together. Lord, we just ask this for them and for us and for all who believe. And we ask this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.